What, why do you think that is and, and where do you think that's all going? Just so that you understand, you know the Mirror Group of newspapers in Britain, it's probably the second biggest news organisation. The, the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror and the Sunday People. They, they were committing the same sorts of crimes as Murdoch's newspaper. And that was part of the problem actually in trying to uncover it all, is that other newspapers wouldn't join in and cover the story because they were either owned by Murdoch and or because they were committing similar crimes. But the, the Mirror Group's crimes are just beginning to come out because the police have got inside there a bit. Now, if you actually pull back and look at it, it's, it's to do with this quite a... a there's a big thing that's happened in the course of my life, which is, you could call it the commercialization of everything. So if you'd gone to the United States in the 1950s when I was born, you'd see it already happening there. But we in Britain, and maybe here, lived in a society where there was a different set of values. We'd come out of the Second World War, we'd elected a Labour government, we created the National Health Service, the BBC, we nationalised industries. We said there's something important here about the value of life. We want a society which isn't too unequal, which doesn't have too much poverty, where maybe we can control our destinies by owning chunks of the economy ourselves. And I, I'm rather proud of what we constructed during those decades after the Second World War. And since April 1979, when Margaret Thatcher was elected, all that good has been slowly dismantled. The forces of commercialism have moved in like some sort of tidal wave across our society. And it produces a kind of deep state of corruption. Oscar Wilde says something very good about cynicism. That a cynic is, the, is a man who knows the price of all things and the value of none. And in that precise sense, we've ended up with a cynical society. And so I would see Rupert Murdoch and his newspapers as just one fragment of that. So if you pull back, say, what's the value in that Oscar Wilde sense? What's the value of a newspaper? It's to uncover the truth about important things. That's what it's good for. But if you put it into the hands of a man like Rupert Murdoch, who is, interest, interestingly enough, psychopathologically greedy, cannot stop accumulating money, it becomes a commercial instrument. And therefore, all of the internal logic starts to get distorted. You can still have good journalists working in there, but the thrust, the overwhelming thrust, particularly in those newspapers which are the mass market, you've got so lots of copies, is just ruthless commercialism. And the valuable stuff gets pushed aside. All that matters is that we get stories that will sell the paper. If they're not true, who's counting? Who cares? And if you have to break the rules, hey, who's enforcing them? And if we break the law, ha, the police aren't going to enforce the law against us. Do you see? It's part of a bigger picture. I should say something here because I work for Rupert Murdoch. I work for a Murdoch newspaper. Um, I work for Sunny Times, which I think is the best newspaper in Britain. And I work for it because it invests in its foreign correspondence. And it's the only paper that I would work for on the foreign side in Britain because he actually does put up the money for us to be able to go and cover the stories properly. We weren't involved in the phone hacking, but the phone hacking that was going on was being done by every single newspaper in the United Kingdom. Right. The, the, the picture with Murdoch and owning newspapers is more complex than outsiders sometimes think. People assume, for example, that he's always interfering with his editors and telling them what to write. My belief, you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that he does that a little bit, but very, very rarely. He interferes with governments. That's what's wrong with Rupert. But on the whole, he, he lets his newspapers get on and do their job to make money. Where the Sunday Times was concerned, so he doesn't, it, and he does put money into newspapers. You can see it in the Australian, in this country. You compare it to the Fairfax papers. It's got more money in it. You can just see it by reading it. But the Sunday Times also was heavily involved in crime. They have this investigative unit, the Insight Team, and they hired as a deputy editor a guy called Dave Connett. He's a very experienced reporter. And they said to him quite explicitly, we want you to look after the illegal stuff. And just in case you get caught, we're going to put you on a freelance contract. So you, you won't have a business card, you won't have an extension in the newsroom. So if it goes wrong, you'll say, well, I'm a freelance, they didn't know about it. And Dave Connett, who's a tough guy, accepted that deal. So he did the illegal stuff for the Insight team. And then they decided, just temporarily for some reason, they, they decided to close the Insight team. They later revived it. So they said to the, uh, you're out, Dave. And he said, well, you can't just chuck me out, I'm staff. I said, no, you're not, you're freelance. 
which was really, really naughty, bad faith. So he took them to an employment tribunal, and I sat in on it. And they had this ghastly executive, whose name we might not mention. Okay, Case B. <laughs> And he's now, by the way, works for the Telegraph. Yeah, he's now the son, a ghastly man. But anyway, he sat there and said, oh, I don't know what Dave Connick's talking about. This tribunal listened to all the evidence and said he's telling the truth. He was hired to do the illegal stuff. So, this, so it, it infiltrates this logic, this horrible ruthlessness, gets into all sorts of places. I think they became, uh, just to can complicate I matters, but, uh, because I think basically what happened in Britain was that there became the papers are so competitive. We yeah. have 12 daily papers, which is probably too many, and um, they would go to any extent to get stories to beat each other. Yeah. That became the main thing. Being first, it wasn't that the story was right or that you did it best. It was being exactly. first, and the problem. Yeah. It is that you know what you exposed, which is very important that you did that. And actually, if you look back at the British Press Awards, <laughs> something like nine out of the last ten um, scoop of the year was won by somebody who'd got the story by phone hacking. <laughs> that shows the level that that went to. But the problem is, as a result of it, people like me who are not involved in any of that, and I'm trying very hard to tell the stories of people overseas in terrible situations. Mm. It's been made much harder to do my 